Hello everyone and welcome to our session about exploring DPDK's role in 5G oh. architecture. So we will welcome three speakers from NVIDIA, Ericsson and Intel. Um, you will be able to ask questions if you go in the chat or in QA. Look at the button. Um, so this session is recorded and we are following the Linux Foundation guideline for antitrust. Uh, in the agenda today, we will show how 5G architecture is standardized in the open run. We'll look at where DPTK fits in the picture, and we will discuss two approaches, one using baseband devices or using a GPU. And at the end, we will answer the question. So, our speakers are Niall Power from Intel, Cloud One Solution Architect. We have Oscar Turol from Ericsson. He is head of technology engineering in Unit Cloud Run. And Elena Agostini from NVIDIA, senior software engineer. Let's start with Niall Power from Intel about 5G Run. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Thomas. So yeah, my name is Niall Power. I'm a solutions architect from Intel focused on the uh, 5G wireless access network. Um, so yeah, today I'll briefly introduce the 5G uh, network architecture, the network functions that make up that network. Um, I'll talk about some of the different implementation options in the ecosystem today. And finally, I'll try and answer the question of where DPDK can be used in these network functions. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so um, this slide shows a simplified view of the 5G network architecture defined by 3GPP, but I've also added the front hall interface definition from the ORAN Alliance. So each of these are different network functions, uh, or each of these blocks are different network functions that make up the network. Uh, and generally, the network is split into two separate functionalities. Um, there's a core network, which is a service-based architecture using cloud-native network interfaces. Um, DPDK can be used in the, uh, the user plane function. So that's the purple blocks that I'm talking about there. Uh, the user plane function of the UPF, which is mainly the layer three packet processing. And that requires high throughput. So it's ideal for DPDK. So then the other area is the, the RAN or the radio access network. Um, and that deals with the, uh, the radio connectivity, transmitting and receiving the air interface signals to the UE or the handset. Um, so the closer you get to the handset or the radio, the more strict the real-time requirements are, um, the low latency requirements. So that's you know basically what DPDK helps bring us um, in the DU uh, closer to the radio unit as it is. Uh, the RAN itself then is made up of, you know, three to four network functions. I say three to four because the, the CU, as you see here, can be optionally split into both the, the CU user plane and the CU uh, control plane, CU UP and CU CP. Um, and then there's also the distributed unit and the radio unit. Um, the operator, you know, the, the operator itself, right, um, whether that's a Vodafone, Verizon, or at t or whoever, and um, they would decide based on their network architecture, you know, whether that would be, you know, the CU would be split or whether it would be um, uh, integrated together. And the operator would also define then where these network functions are actually located geographically within the network. Um, so that would be, you know, whether the DU and the RU, you know, more than likely would be distributed um, out at the cell site, right? So out near close to the cell tower where you actually have the RU at the top of the, the cell tower itself. Um, but then the CU could be uh, distributed along with the RU uh, or the RU and the DU as well, or it could be centralized, right? Depending on the operator's network infrastructure, whether they have enough uh, bandwidth for the connectivity between the DU and the CU. Um, but basically, um, you know, the, the operator would decide that. As well as that, then the, you know, the, the more centralized you are, the more aggregated um, the, the network traffic that you, you do. So 
Um, so while a DU might connect to, you know, three or six radio units, um, depending then on whether the CU is centralized, that uh, the CU could service, you know, 10 or more DUs. And the UPF then could be in a large geographical area servicing, you know, um, many CUs, right, depending on the, the deployment. Okay, um, next slide. Okay, so here I was, I was just trying to capture some of the different solutions um, available in the ecosystem today. Um, and I guess the main thing to say is that all of these follow the 3 b specifications, but just, you know, implemented um, differently. So um, on the left, you have the, the purpose-built um, RAN, which is essentially like a, a black box, right? So an operator would purchase um, both the, the hardware and software, um, the solution, right, as a whole um, from the vendor. Um, and, and they don't really mind then, you know, what's in it or how it's implemented. They're just buying the, the G node B network function. Then in the middle, then it's kind of cloud run, right? So that's where uh, traditionally is following the NFE route of um, virtualizing the network functions. And so that's taking, you know, the DU, the CU, uh, running them in a, a virtualized environment or a cloud, cloud native environment. And here is where you might have different uh, vendors. You might have a different hardware vendor, GPP hardware vendor, um, different uh, RAN software vendor, and even then the OS and Kubernetes. And then on the right hand side then is where ORAN Alliance, uh, which has come in, um, and that's where it's defined the the interfaces between those blocks, right? So it has now um, really defining a multi-vendor uh, solution, right? Because once you define those interfaces, then you can have easy integration between the different vendors providing different components of the overall um, network. Uh, ORAN is also where the breakout of the front all interface uh, happened. So that's where it splits the RU from the DU. Um, the, the RU would, uh, you know, traditionally be a purpose-built function, right? That's normally uh, potentially at the top of the cell tower, right? So it has all the antennas in it as well. Um, so that wouldn't be normally virtualized or running on, on GPP um, platforms, but then the DU and the CU are the pieces that are, um, are virtualized and run on GPP platforms. Um, ORAN also defines the uh, the orchestration and management of the ORAN network functions. So they have different interfaces defined for that. Um, and they also, you know, in terms of uh, configuring those through the, I think they have a, it's an O1 interface. Um, but they also define the orchestration and management then through the, the cloud platform itself um, from the O2 interface. Uh, and it's within that uh, cloud platform uh, definition of the O cloud, as ORAN has defined it, um, where ORAN has specified the interfaces to the hardware accelerators. And one of those interfaces that they've standardized is based on DPDK and BB Dev interfaces, which I'll talk about on the next slide, please. Okay, so. So ORAN, as I said, has defined um, an acceleration abstraction layer. And, and that's to, you know, the purpose of that is to abstract the underlying hardware acceleration technology from the ORAN software network function. So to try and make, make sure that um, uh, different vendor solutions are interchangeable with different um, software network functions. And in this case, you know, it's primarily focused on the DU um, right now. Um, and so while the, the AAL from ORAN is about abstracting the hardware accelerators, you know, to some extent as well, memory management um, associated with those accelerators, you know, there's lots of more uh, other environment variables and dependencies that software application um, should be abstracted from. Um, and, you know, if you look at DPDK EAL and the environment abstraction layer, that has a lot of those um, other aspects already, right? Like CPUs, um, OS, uh, the different uh, instruction sets or ISAs that are supported, and of course, memory as well. And so that's why I believe that the DPDK is actually a really good um, implementation option for the ORAN AAL uh, uh, interface itself. Right? Um, and then if I look at the interface that they have standardized, which is based on DPDK, it's actually based on the DPDK BB Dev uh, interface. So this is one that's been standardized for uh, one particular type of offload, which is the forward error correction and for acceleration. 
So that's a portion of the DU um, layer one functionality that can be offloaded to specific hardware acceleration to improve the performance. Um, and the diagram here is just showing a very high level picture of how BBDev provides that abstraction. Um, so similar to most uh, devices in DPDK, there is the application interface and um, kind of the northbound interface there. Um, and then there's the device facing interface or, or the southbound interface. And that allows then different pole mode drivers for each of the different hardware acceleration um, implementations to integrate with the BBDev uh, or DPDK framework um, while maintaining the same application facing interface, right? So the application then becomes fully abstracted um, regardless of whether it's, um, you know, an, an FPGA solution, an EA6 solution or a GPU solution. Um, and Intel has defined and, and um, uh, contributed um, all of our past uh, past and present hardware accelerators to DPDK. So you see that we have FPGA drive, pole mode drivers, EASIC, and also now the latest um, pole mode driver for the integrated acceleration in the fourth gen uh, Xeon scalable processors. The API, then the application API itself, BBDev, is a pole mode interface, right? Similar to other DPDK interfaces, and has a simple in queue and DQ set of operations to offload the work to the hardware accelerator. Okay, next slide. Okay, so here I give uh, the, the next two slides, actually I give kind of two examples of where DPDK um, can be used right within the DU and, and the CU network functions. So most of these examples are based on the Intel FlexRAN reference implementation. Um, but you know, suitable for other implementations as well, right? Um, so first up is the the CU, the central unit, or uh, specifically the CU UP, the user plane. Um, so as you can see from the picture, right, the the CU is mainly kind of layer three packet processing, and there's some IPsec, um, IP UDP, and GTP processing, um, which are you know standard and already supported heavily in DPDK. Um, then the main one is the PDCP or packet data convergence protocol, which is defined by 3GP. Well, in fact, the entire stack is defined by 3GP, but um, PDCP is the, the main um, kind of portion of that, right, from a, a RAN perspective. And that does a lot of uh, sequence numbers. So, um, you know, making sure that the packets are in the sequence, the order that um, is needed for the RAN. Um, and then it also, the, the some header compression can be added there, robust header compression. Um, but the main thing is the encryption and authentication, which is added as part of the PDCP um, protocol. So that's the, this is the layer that actually adds the encryption um, and authentication to the messages that are sent from between, directly between the network or the DU in this case, uh, CU and the user plane or the user phone. Um, the UE itself, right? So this is actually the protection that gets added onto everybody's, every unique user has their own unique keys that are set up for this encryption. And um, so in the purple block there for, for DPDK, I've listed kind of the different DPDK um, libraries and devices um, that can be used to support the CU implementation. So there's obviously the Ethernet device, right? For the packet IO, Membuff, mempool associated with that and, and other things. Um, mainly as well, then there's the crypto device. So that supports um, both the IPsec processing and also the wireless ciphers like um, for the PDCP processing like Zook, um, Zook, Snow3G and AES uh, CTR are the different algorithms that are specified as part of the, um, the PDCP protocol. Um, and they're all supported in the crypto dev. Uh, whether that's either a hardware implementation or even a software implementation as well. I believe there's support for it. Um, there's also more recently, I've, I've seen a PDCP library in DPDK, um, and that gives uh, good examples uh, or kind of like an SDK type library um, where you can, um, uh, it, it implements the sequence numbers and then it prepares the packets for um, offload to the crypto dev. It actually uses the crypto dev and uh, reorder 
uh, libraries um, underneath uh, or as part of that PDCP library. Okay, so next slide then, I talk about the uh, the DU functions, right? So this is the distributed unit. So um, the distributed unit generally um, can be discussed in terms of the layer one and layer two uh, functions. Um, so the layer one or the hi-fi um, does the, the air interface processing. So in terms of the modulation and, and encoding of the signal to be sent over the air interface. Um, and also then on the, the other side, right, the demodulation and decoding on the receive side. Um, while the layer two does some uh, packet processing, right, RLC, MAC, PDUs, and some segmentation of the packets um, to be sent to the layer one, right, it gets them into the right size packets to be sent over the air interface. Um, it also does, obviously, the, the uh, transmission and uh, reception of the IP-based packets between the DU and the CU, right, into if they're separated in different points of the network. Um, and generally, the, the layer two kind of controls the, the layer one um, functionality as well. Um, so the, the DU, as I said, has a kind of strict real-time requirements, right? So low latency is really important for that. So um, for a lot of it, it, it DPDK, you know, the, the IO processing through the Ethernet dev um, is used. Um, just in terms of the data rates, right? So, I mean, uh, a typical radio, it could be a 10 gig radio or a 25 gig radio or even a 50 gig radio. So, you know, for a DU, um, a couple of hundred gig IO is not uh, uncommon. Um, and that there's actually a front hall library that's been um, an open source front hall library contributed by Intel to the ORAN software community. And that's actually using DPDK for the IO processing. Um, and then some of the other blocks. So we talked about uh, ORAN has standardized the BB Dev interface. So that's uh, there available um, for the, the layer one uh, FEC offload. There's also some of the GPU um, devices as well, which um, I believe Elena will talk about later. Um, so uh, yeah, that's kind of from the layer one side. Oh, there's also then um, other functions then obviously, you know, that can be used for um different uh combinations right so you have the rte ring library um which we use within flexran as a shared memory interface between the layer one and the layer two applications right so we want to keep them separate um because the the functionality that they have is very different um but that provides a low latency interface and meets you know allows us to meet the ggp processing requirements so as you can see, there's a good few examples of where DBDK can be used within the 5G RAN network. I'm sure I've uh, left a few out, but um, yeah, we can capture some of the others in, in the discussion later. So I'll hand it back to you, Thomas. Yeah, thank you, Nayal. Uh, I'm sure there is a lot of questions. So please don't hesitate to write your question now in the QA or in the chat and we will answer everything at the end. So now, uh, welcome Oscar Turrell, Head of Technology, Claude Run in Ericsson. Yeah, thank you, Thomas, uh, and, and uh, happy to be here. So, yeah, I will talk a bit about, uh, you know, our uh, Ericsson implementation uh, and looking at, you know, some more high level view of, of uh, you know, the specific uh, Ericsson implementation. So if you go to the, the next slide. <clears throat> I think uh, Neil uh, already gone through this in, in a bit of detail, but but I just wanted to you know give a bit of a overall topology view. So so as you see, uh, according to Oran, there is an orchestration layer. There is uh, you know uh, core pieces, uh, and we have the uh, you know uh, DU and CU components. And this is typically done in in a network. So if you take an operator like you know Verizon or AT and T, you know there's an orchestration layer. There's uh, you know an ENM uh, or in the Oran defined as the SMO components where you orchestrate your, your network. Uh, there is uh, the core uh, side of it where you set up uh, you know the regional uh, setup of the number of, of um, network components. And then as, as Neil already talked about, in a distributed or centralized manner, you can then deploy your, your uh, uh, 
uh, VCU functions, VDU functions across the networks. Uh, typically, in a in a distributed ROM context, you would have, you know, the DU co-located uh, at the edge. Uh, that requires, you know, specific uh, specific uh, requirements when it comes to, uh, you know, robustness and and uh, 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 power. For instance, there is a number of different standards in the US. We have the NEBS three standard, which define how the video uh, needs to act in case of, uh, you know, being uh, uh, in uh, emergent situations or earthquakes or similar. So, so there's a number of different requirements. Also, how much of the power draw that is allowed on, on the DU side. So, but there's a number of different topologies on how you can deploy this in your networks, but it's the same type of functions and it's the same type of software that is going around that. If you then take that and then look at from a DPDK perspective. So in Cloud Run, uh, we have deployed this uh, across the network and, and these are then cloud native functions. Uh, they are built on uh, Kubernetes uh, uh, infrastructure. And uh, we have then, you know, basically the three layers that we talked about. Uh, in the previous picture. So if you go to the next slide, okay, maybe click two times here. So, so if we start from the management orchestration layer, here we have a number of, of um, uh, cloud native functions that are deployed and are needed for our network. Uh, not all of them are then using DPDK, but one in the management orchestration is uh, is in the uh, Ericsson charging. So this again uh, takes use of of the packet handling capabilities in in the DPDK libraries and uh, making sure that we fulfill all the compliance when it comes to being able to to um, use this across ne across networks. So if you take the next level. We then, on the core network side, uh, we already talked about here, uh, both the packet core gateway and the packet core controller. Uh, we we need, uh, from, from telco requirement perspective, to use the DPDK uh, packaging functions. Uh, also in, in the IMS and when it comes to those type of messages. But also on the packet core gateway, uh, we are using DPDK because we see that the performance requirements that we have uh, are actually being fulfilled and we have a, a common topology and a common uh, interface across the industry. We can go to next. And then finally, in, in the Cloud Run uh, space, we have already talked about uh, the VCU. Uh, on the user plane side, we are utilizing uh, DPDK or a packet processing in the PDCP that Nail already talked about here. And also for the VDU. And, and when we talk about the forward error correction piece, that is actually one of the most compute intensive pieces of the layer one software. So that is where we have seen utilizing VBDEV and using a standardized interface towards that uh, that uh, type of acceleration, we are able to have a very portable and flexible solution on the standardized DPDK-based interfaces. And why do we need that? So if we take the next uh, slide then. So basically we have um, a number of challenges that we, that we want to address uh, here. So, as you know, we have been developing software uh, on our purpose-built uh, systems for many years, and uh, we have um, now been uh, looking at the shifting landscape here and the ask to disaggregate the system. And obviously, by doing that, we need to uh, you know look at the future mobile networks and look at the move towards a cloud-native, intelligent, and open network. Uh, 
we then see that DPDK is playing and fulfilling a lot of those requirements when it comes to our packet processing, when it comes to having the, the 3D PDP defined interfaces uh, uh, in an open environment. And we believe that that is a flexible and very cost efficient way to solve this. So obviously we're looking at a distributed deployment it's super important that we have the efficiency to utilize all the available CPU resources for the application. We see that this type of deployment will allow that and will give us a portability that we need. And going forward, I think this is where we see you know, some of the challenges here when it comes to observability and maybe a bit of an ask for us to, you know, as a community here, contributing and working in the uh, the foundation and with DPDK that, you know, looking at how we can balance observability and performance across the different uh, platforms and actually utilize our resources to the best. So if you take the next slide, by, by using this, um, in our cloud run system, we are then able to, using our own software on the management orchestration and the cloud run CU and DU, we can put this on a number of different uh, cloud platforms and container platforms on a number of different servers. And using the DPDK, we will have a full portability on the bare metal servers as they, uh, as we evolve the system here. I think this is a, a true strength of this uh, this uh, open community. And if you go to the next slide, we have then been able to show that uh, by being able to, you know, very straightforwardly porting our software between, for instance, an Intel-based uh, um, uh, approach and with an AMD x86 based approach. And this was very straightforward. I mean, basically no code change at all. Uh, so I think this shows and proves the uh, flexibility and openness of this solution. We also are looking at exploring other opportunities here. You know, there's uh, other type of architectures here. And we believe that DBDEV is covering you know, a lot of that uh, opportunity. So if you go to the next slide, we talked a bit about Cloud RAN and Open RAN as being two different uh, things. We really believe from Ericsson that we see Cloud RAN as the way that we industrialize Open RAN. So we are fully committed uh, both to deploy the service management and orchestration layer uh, across open APIs, uh, the Cloud Run solution with the, all the interfaces according to the um, Oran specification, and also the open front hall towards uh, radios. And I think uh, some testament to prove that we actually have been quite successful in, in uh, this journey is the recent announcement by at and for instance, to uh, pioneer the networks of the future together with us uh, in, in a, a huge deal over the next coming five years. So, thank you, Thomas. Thank you, thank you, Oscar. I, I don't know if you see if you hear me. Yeah, thank you, Oscar. Um, so I see that question starts flowing. Don't be shy and ask whatever you wish to know. And now uh, we are welcoming Elena Agostini, senior software engineer at NVIDIA and specialist in 5G with GPU. Thank you, Thomas. So hello, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm Elena Agostini from NVIDIA. And basically, in this presentation, I will give you some insights and uh, an overview about how we build uh, our 5G software named Arial, and which specifically which DPDK components we use to implement uh, our solution. So uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So this is kind of, you know, um, 
uh, recalling the previous slide um, about um, let's say the DU uh, components that you can find uh, you can find in a five G five uh, G network, and I want to highlight the position of Arial. So where Arial is actually working at which level level. So the goal of Arial is is to offload the layer one, so the physical layer of the DU um, on the GPU. So basically offload the signal processing on the GPU. And this is the first part. The second part, of course, uh, the second goal or role of Arial is to offer an interface to communicate with um, radio units through the front hall. So the, basically the connection between the DU and the radio units um, um, spread and connected to the, to the DU. Um, in order to implement this communication, Arial must be ORAN uh, compliant because ORAN is the protocol that uh, defines the rules in how the DU should communicate with radio units. So these are the two things Arial is trying to accomplish. Um, offload the physical signal, the physical layer, so the signal processing on the GPU. So of course we need a GPU device on the system and communicate with radio units um, um, on the front hall being ORAN compliant. So we need a network card. So these are mostly the two uh, the two devices that that we need in Arial to implement that part of the DU. And of course, there's also um, the communication with upper layers of the DU through the FAP interface and so on. Um, in terms of which DPDK components uh, we use to implement the software, uh, well. A lot of them, honestly. Uh, first of all, of course, we needed to use the Ethernet device um, and the Ethernet uh, DPDK library uh, to prepare send queues, receive queues, and to communicate with radio units over the Ethernet connection with them. And I mean, we use the Ethernet device to send and receive packets both on the C plane, that is uh, the control plane that DU and re, where DU and radio units basically exchange control packets to synchronize their activities, but we also use it on the U plane um, to basically exchange uh, packets on the U plane that are uh, basically data packets. In the case of U plane, though, um, the actual data that must be exchanged with radio units resides on the GPU memory, uh, because as I said, the signal processing is happening on the GPU. So we need the DPDK uh, Ethernet library to send those packets, but those packets must be fetched from the GPU memory. So that's why we also need the GPU dev library. The GPU dev library in combination with the mempool um, is capable to create a mempool where, uh, with external embuffs. So the, um, let's say, metadata or header of the MBUF resides in CPU, but the actual MBUF payload resides on the GPU. So the final effect is that the GPU can uh, basically run signal processing, store the outcome, so the result in the GPU mempool, um, let's say the GPU part of the mempool, and then from the CPU, the PDK can send those packets directly, uh, fetching them from the GPU memory. This is for the send side, but of course, uh, it's the same for the receive side. We need to receive packets from the radio units. So we, uh, we, we use another component of, the, uh, component of DPDK that is um, RTFlow. Uh, basically, with RTFlow, we can create multiple receive queues and using EC3 flow steering rules and other, uh, I mean, other uh, flow steering rules that you can apply uh, with DPDK to the receive queues, we can clearly understand from which radio units uh, we are receiving packets. So we can kind of simplify our algorithm on the GPU because we are really, uh, we can make some assumptions. Like if I'm receiving packets from this queue means that, that the radio unit connected to this queue is sending to me packets and so on. I mean, all of this logic can be offloaded to the network card thanks to the PTK flow. Another nice feature that we use is the timestamping. Um, basically, the DK offers you the, the possibility to create packets and assign to those packets a timestamp in the future. So the network card will take care of sending those packets in the future at the right time, and the software doesn't have to worry about it. The, the software can, ju can just prepare the packet and file it over the network card. So we heavily use this technique 
on the downlink, that is the send side, um, while sending you open packets. Um, so uh, next slide, please. Okay, so to, um, let's say, highlight um, in a better way which DPDK components we use in our Arial 5G software and where they are positioned, I, I try to depict, uh, depict the flow in uplink and downlink. So when you are in uplink uh, in a 5G network, it means that the DU is receiving U-plane packets from the radio units. Um, so starting from the left side of the picture, you can see that there are radio units sending U-plane packets, so data packets, um, through the Oran frontal interface to our DU. On the DU side, as I said, we have the network card waiting for uh, those packets, and we use, as I said, the PDK uh, ATH dev and the PDK flow to receive packets in different receive queues um, in order to clearly identify to which radio unit that packet uh, belongs. But we need to do signal processing on the GPU. So we need to directly receive those packets in GPU memory in order to trigger immediately the packet processing um, on the packets coming from the radio units. So in order to avoid um, additional CPU memory copies, and you know, in order to avoid to involve the CPU more in this process, we create combining um, the mempool library with the GPU dev library of DPDK. We create uh, DPDK mempools having the MBUF payload in GPU memory. So, as I explained before, the final effect of this is that if you create this uh, GPU mempool to the receive queues of DPDK, you will directly receive packets in GPU memory. So what happens is packets are flowing into the GPU memory and the GPU through a list of CUDA kernels keeps processing those packets in order to rebuild the original frame every time slot of 500 microseconds of all the packets coming from different radio units. Once the original frame is rebuilt, uh, we have the full payload per radio unit and then the GPU can apply the signal processing that is, um, let's say, a list of uh, several CUDA tasks um, applying uh, physical uh, signal processing, and the final outcome, outcome is stored into a GPU buffer uh, somewhere in the memory of the GPU. And then through the FAP interface, the outcome of the uplink calculation is forwarded to the upper layers directly from the GPU memory. So this was uplink. Now let's see in the next slide the downlink. So downlink seems a bit more complicated, but um, I mean, um, there's more uh, parallel activity in downlink between the CPU and the GPU. So first of all, as I said, if we are in downlink, it means that we want to produce some data and send this data over the network to the, our radio units. So the command of starting a new downlink slot actually starts from the upper layers of the DU. So our software, Arial, residing on the layer one, receives this information through the FAP interface, and then the things happen. So the first one is that the CPU launches on the GPU the signal processing, like I received the indication to produce downlink output data to be, to, to, to be sent to this list of radio units, so it triggers the list of CUDA kernels on the GPU to actually exercise the signal processing and produce the data to be sent. While the GPU is doing this, on the CPU side, we use, um, let's say, uh, a CPU thread to create, the, to pre-create the header of the packets we want to send in downlink to the radio unit, and we assign a timestamp to those packets. Everything done through the PDK mempool, and thanks to the, let's say, um, the PDK external EMBA feature, because the header of these packets reside in CPU but the actual payload of these packets reside in GPU memory with another GPU mempool created ad hoc for the downlink session, for the downlink, uh, let's say, uh, side of the flow. So there is a parallel activity. While the CPU is using a CPU memory mempool to create the packet header and setting a timestamp to those packets, the GPU is creating the, out, the data to be sent through the signal processing and it's storing those data into the packets in the mempool residing in GPU memory. 
the final effect is that the, the, the CPU will be able to push on the NIC, on the network card, packets composed partially by CPU memory, so the, um, the header, and partially in, um, from the GPU memory, so the payload of the packet. So basically, the CPU waits for the completion of the GPU work and, as I said, push all of these things, all of those packets, into the network card, in the send queues of the network card, still using the PDK Ethernet to do that, ATH uh, dev specifically. What happens is when the right time comes in the future, the network card will send those packets. So using the timestamping feature. So the software is, again, push the packets onto the NIC and the software ju can just keep going doing other stuff. Uh, but the network card will take care of sending the packets at the right time in the future at hardware level. And the final effect of this overall composition, let's say, can be seen in the uh, up right corner of the picture of the slide, sorry, where basically you can see that not all the packets are just sent over the network um, all at the same time, basically all together. They are sent following a time and pattern. So basically, when you are uh, in 5G networks, you need to respect time slots, typically of 500 micro. But each time slot is divided into 14 symbols, each one composed by 36 microseconds. So what you need to achieve is basically to send every symbol a subset of the total number of packets you want to send in downlink uh, dedicated to that symbol. And timestamping is uh, the best feature you can use to do this. So the final effect is that the radio units on the right side of the of the slide basically will receive all the downlink packets, but divided in time symbols of 36 uh, microseconds. And that's it for me. Okay, great. Great, thank you, Elena. So now it's time for question. Um, Okay, I will start with one very easy. Someone was asking if the slides and recording will be shared. So yes, the Linux Foundation will help us to publish all this content. Uh, so now I would like to quickly answer a few questions about GPU as it's fresh. Um, first question, it's about FAPI. So FAPI is a specification. Maybe first uh, you can explain Elena or someone what is FAPI? How does it fit with Open Run? And the question is, uh, does Arial 5G Run support FAPI? Uh, which version of FAPI does it support? So uh, FAPI is uh, not strictly related, related to the GPU um, activity I was describing. It's most, mostly the standard uh, protocol that you want to use in a DU if you want to put in communication the layer one with the layer two. So uh, for example, in the, in the aerial architecture, I just uh, explained, uh, layer one is from NVIDIA, layer two may be from other vendors, and they need to find a common way to communicate. So they, they have to exchange information um, through the FAPI message. Now, uh, depending on the architecture of the DU, uh, you want to implement, you can have layer one and layer two on the same machine. So you can exchange those um, messages through shared memory, for example, because they reside on the same system, just different processes. Or you may want to use a more distributed architecture where you have layer one on one machine and layer two and others, upper layers on another machine. So you need to establish uh, a real communication over the network between them. Um, but that's, again, the standard uh, that we use to communicate. Specifically, the latest version we use as a FAPI standard, I am not uh, sure I can come back offline on this, so I don't give you a false information. OK, good. Another question about uh, version. Uh, does IRL 5G front hall interface support CAT B? What is cat B? That's the question. Do you understand the question? No. Yeah, yeah, that's another version uh, version question I'm, I'm not uh, fully yeah. aware of. So I can, uh, if it's for me the question, I will come back offline notes on this. Just okay. to give you the latest one we are using. 
Okay. Now the question is, does it support any cat B interface? Um, I don't think so. We have a specific version, but again, let me come back yeah. to this. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, another question uh, about Arial, maybe the last one. Um, someone wants to know if Arial is a proof of concept or is it already deployed? Uh, it's for me. Um, yeah, for, for IIR. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Specifically uh, about the NVIDIA solution. Okay. Um, so if you want to access Arial, uh, it's in early access. You have to register on the website, uh, but it's already, you know, it's already a solution. So we are we are starting to adopt it in production, um, but it's not, you know, open source. You need to register to the NVIDIA program to access it. And apply okay. for the program. And so, is it deployed in a network or FR1, FR2, TDD, FDD? I don't know if we have this kind of information. Yes, yes, uh, it's actively deployed and used. Um, that that's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, let's switch uh, for a moment to Ericsson solution. Someone. Is asking if the Ericsson Cloud Run run on ARM servers. Yeah, as I said, uh, uh, we, we currently have been uh, working on, on uh, the Intel and AMD solutions. Obviously, uh, ARM servers are, are using a, a reduced instruction set, so, so uh, you know, not not. Um, all software is, is as easily portable, but according uh, across the DBDEV interface, we believe that that will be uh, possible as well. So, so it's uh, we we don't uh, uh, we, we don't have an official version of that yet. Okay. Um, one more question. Uh, I read it. If Level one and level two are separate DPDK application. What kind of interface is used? So I think it was targeting the beginning of the presentation. Is yeah. it MEMI for plain DPDK yes. rings? Yeah, so so layer one and layer two um, can be separate applications. They don't have to be separate. They can be all part of the one application, right? But um, yeah, within the FlexRAN, we have enabled separate layer one and layer two applications, and we just use the RTE ring uh, library with a shared memory interface. So they have, you know, you have a primary and secondary process. So pretty straightforward, you know, nothing specific or anything done there with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, question about multi tenancy is it common in virtual RAM in general? Do we see some multi tenancy architecture? I mean, it's not impossible if I answer. Uh, uh, you know, multi-tenancy has a tendency to be, uh, you know, asked for, but then when you ask the operators, uh, there's very limited interest in sharing, uh, sharing uh, in, in many cases. So, uh, you know, technically you, you can uh, run multi-tenancy uh, either as, you know, multiple videos on, on the same, platform or uh, uh, you know other ways there's also a neutral host solution that will solve some of these problems where where you uh, do the counting outside of the system uh, so so it depends on there's nothing technically is uh, stopping uh, multi tenancy uh, okay thank you um Okay, something different. Uh, it's about Kubernetes. Uh, what are the key parts to ensure orchestration is done correctly? Yeah, this is a good question, I think, because, um, you know, I think, like I said in, in the talk, the ORAN defines the interfaces to orchestrate and manage the network functions, right? So that's one aspect of it, and that's really important. But then as well, the hardware needs to be orchestrated and managed as well. So from the cloud infrastructure, you're acceleration devices, right, that, that need to do that. DPDK provides the application level interface. ORAN are also trying to standardize then the management 
um, interface for those devices. Um, I, I know, you know, Intel has provided uh, Kubernetes operators um, to be able to manage and orchestrate the hardware accelerators that um, that we provide, right? So I think that's one important aspect. And then, of course, the network functions themselves, right? <laughs> they they need to support, you know, cloud native uh, best practices, right? Um, to be able to do that. But that's the the one of the main premise, right? Of CloudRan or or ORAN is, you know, to adopt the cloud native um, best practices, right? Including the orchestration of that, so that you can get the the scale and and the um, the opex savings uh, through those principles. Okay, thank you. Um, a question about uh, timing. If we have a distributed L2 and L1, what can be the jitter on the transport network without breaking the synchronization between the two layers? Do we have a, a number of uh, an acceptable jitter? So, I mean, from, from a 3GPP's pers perspective, you know, they specify the 500 microseconds, uh, right, TTI, right? That's your that's your budget. How you split that budget up is up to your implementation. So if you want to spend, you know, 20 microseconds of that on a network interface between two platforms, right, because you get better scalability that way, or, you know, you have any unique feature, that's the the implementation choice, right? So there's not one number I could say, right, that um, would answer that. I think it's a, a trade-off that somebody has to to make, right? So you have less processing time for your layer one function if you're spending uh, more latency over a, a separate interface, right, between the layer one and the layer two. And it okay. also depends on how you have distributed, uh, you know, the uh, a lower fi as well in, in, mm. in the region. so the overall jitter and, and you know the distribution between antenna and baseband is also impacting this so 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 it's uh, i agree with neil there's no <laughs> there's no uh, uh, number a specific number okay uh more question about some uh, numbers uh, first, uh, Elena, there is a question to know which GPU and CPU are used in IIOL. Do we have some specific which devices? Which GPU and which CPU? CPU, yes. yeah. Is it an ARM um, CPU? Is it, uh, so it's, uh, so that's a good question. So uh, by default, we use uh, Intel x86 CPUs um, to, to run, I mean, in the configuration where we have uh, this on the host and the GPU, uh, it can be V100 or A100. Um, we can also run this on the Bluefield, um, on the DPU converse card. And in that case, it would be the ARM cores of the of the DPU converse cards. Um, so we are trying different solutions and measuring the performance in both, uh, in both scenarios. The network card is typically, um, Connectix 60X or Connect 7, Connectix 7. Now we are migrating to Connectix 7. And in the case of Bluefield, Bluefield 3, of course, because Bluefield 3 has Connectix uh, 7 as a, as a GP, um, network card. Okay. So with that being said, now there is a question about power conception, comparing solution with Intel devices and NVIDIA devices. The question specifically is, is for four cells, TDD, 100 megahertz. It's a bit technical. But it, yeah, in, in, yeah. So, yeah. I, I mean, you, you have to take more into account, right? I mean, the the overall system, right, is, is the platform, right? So you have your, your platform, your CPU, your NIC cards, your accelerator cards, right? That's that's the whole thing comes into account. It's not a simple um, apples to apples comparison, really, um, unless you get really, really specific on the solution. Um, yeah, so I I, I don't have a <laughs> don't have an answer. No, and maybe I can comment uh, as I talked mm -hmm. about the, in, in uh, before that. You know there are some some requirements. So if if you take for instance Nets three, there is a requirement on 
you know how much power draw you can have uh, on on the forage, uh, and typically if you want to fit uh, you know a GPU into that solution and you want to have a a you know a total cost of ownership that is reasonable, you need to then you know do the math on can you fit this into one server? What is the power draw across the system? And uh, how do you make sure to fulfill, uh, you know, the compliance uh, pieces? Mm -hmm. We have seen that the single server deployment is what is being asked uh, of in, in the DRON context. And I think that's why we have, uh, uh, you know, our main track now is working on on the, the for error correction acceleration only. Yeah, because we have struggled to see power draw on the DPUs uh, uh, fitting that uh, envelope. But it all depends on what type of capacity and performance you're asking for at the edge, obviously. Yeah, and that's why as well, when you look at, you know, the latest um, fortune Xeon scalable processors with the, they've actually integrated now the acceleration, right? So that delivers an extra, I think it was up to 20% power saving when you, you integrate that acceleration into the CPU so you can avoid having the external accelerator altogether. Yeah, so definitely power consumption is one criteria, capacity of the solution in one other criteria. Uh, there is maybe, yeah, Elena, you want to say something? No, okay. Um, there is maybe something else which is asked in the question uh, about the latency. Is the latency a criteria? How can we make sure the latency is not too high? Yeah, you, um, you mean software latency? I, I missed that question. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be, yeah. Because um, we are using DPDK CPU software. Yeah. How can we make sure the latency is, I mean, is not going too high? I mean, yeah, that's what DPDK um, brings, right? In terms of reducing the latency on that front all interface, right, uh, between the the NIC and the CPU, and also then between the CPU and the accelerators, whether it's the GPU or integrated acceleration, right? That reduces the overall latency. Um, between that, and then it's it's you know it's up to the individual uh, implementation, right? So software implementation, you can scale across multiple cores and do things in parallel to reduce the latency, um, and the same I guess on a on a GPU solution as well, right? So um, it's it's really just down to the implementation. You know, so yeah, when a GPU at least GPU is in the picture, you need to take care about the memory, you know, alignment of sequential mm -hmm. writes into GPU memory, for example, optimize PCIe readings uh, or writings, sorry, honestly. Um, you know, on the system, take care of the PC topology you have in your system, like for example, uh, to establish the best communication you can have between the network card and the GPU, for example, when the network card is receiving packets and storing them in GPU memory, you need to you need to have a dedicated PCA switch between the two, or at least a dedicated PCA layer between the network card and the GPU, so they can communicate at the fastest in the fastest way possible. So you reduce also the latency in the communication internally, internal to the system. Um, you know, a lot of optimizations, as you said, depending also on the accelerator you want to use. Okay, thank you. Now I would like to switch to a few questions about orchestration, Kubernetes. Uh, first, when uh, we're running user plane, data plane, are we using a CNI in Kubernetes? Um, so I, I can talk from the, the FlexRAN reference solution. So as I said, between the layer one and the layer two, we, we use that DPDK shared memory interface. Um, between multiple pods, then, you know, the, the DU and the CU, it's not just the layer one and the layer two. So that was just the high level picture, right? There's also like O&M functions, um, telemetry functions. You know, there's a lot of other um, management aspects to deploying a network function. So while you might have the layer one in the layer one and layer two in one pod, right? You might have all these other functions or services in multiple pods. And for those, I think definitely a CNI, a standard CNI would be, you know, more than suitable for for the the latencies and data rates that they're expecting. But for the the data path, I think you know, uh, DPDK, SRIV, and shared memory interfaces are probably the way to go. Okay, and do we support load balancing across multiple instances with Kubernetes? L is that for me or? 
load balancing of yeah. the in BB Dev. So in BB Dev, yeah, load balancing mm -hmm. is supported. You can have uh, multiple uh, virtual functions, um, right? Or, or BB Dev devices instantiated, and each pod can have its own uh, different virtual function with it, its own um, priority of of uh, um, task, you know, tasks to be executed. Okay. Well, I'm going to step in here. We are at time, so we'd like to thank everyone for participating, all of our panelists, and and Thomas, thank you for emceeing and um, for everyone who attended. Uh, so glad to have you here. Yeah, happy to be. Here. Thank you, thank yeah. you, everybody. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thank you. It was a pleasure. Yeah, thanks very much. Well, See bye. you. Bye.